Well, good morning, church. Welcome. So wonderful to be with you again this good morning that God has made for us together. If you haven't already, i um, love for you to register your attendance this morning with us. Uh, you could do that on our website at thenations.asia and go, up, go to the signups page, or you can do that on Church Suite, which is our church app that we use for um, signing up for different events and things that are happening, the different activities and events that are going on. So if you would like to um, be able to access our church through Church Suite, you can send us an email at admin at the nations.asia and we can get those credentials out to you so you can connect with us that way. Especially if you're new and um, visiting this, this morning with us or you've been attending for a little while and just want to shout out and know, let us know that you're here with us. We'd love to know that. And a good way is just to register your attendance this morning and just share with us that you're new and visiting with us. And we'd, it'd be our joy to just reach out to you and just tell you thank you and connect with you in any way, shape and form in terms of how we can serve you and be of any help for you going forward. And speaking of, if you are um, looking to get to know about us as the nation's church and to perhaps even get involved in the work and the vision that God's given to us as the nations, you can join our next growth track, which is coming up quite quickly in a few weeks at the end of September. September 27th is the date. You can also sign up for that growth track. It's going to happen four consecutive Sundays, and you can sign up there on that sign-ups page on our website or through Church Suite. We're going to be covering not only just the amazing history of how the nations came to be, but the most important vision that God's given to us through allowing Christians, every believer, to recognize their freedom that they have in Christ Jesus and how to live from the strength of God's Holy Spirit to go and discover and fulfill his purpose in our lives. So that's what Growth Track is all about. We'd love to have you join us. We'll send out those details in terms of how we're going to meet, where we're going to meet, all that stuff, depending on the, the how the month progresses. So if you sign up, we'll make sure you get to hear and get updated on all those details. Um, an update also on the gatherings, if you've been following along on this and um, if you've been signing up. Hopefully, if you signed up for the gatherings, you've received word early last week that we have postponed the start of the gatherings that was supposed to launch today due to what's been going on in our surrounding and their circumstances. However, we are meeting as leaders and, and hosts this afternoon to see a new date here, so be um, on the lookout via email or chat or however your leader is going to be communicating to you about that because it's um, ever so changing and we'd love to be able to start up as soon as possible, but we want to do it prayerfully and so we'll let you know about that this week, very soon, I believe. Um, if you want to join a gathering, uh, you can do that through Church Suite. That's going to mainly happen through Church Suite. So if you don't have access to Church Suite, again, Church Suite, again, just go ahead and email us at admin at the nations.asia and we'll get those credentials out to you. Wonderful. One last thing I want to mention, it's a special announcement. Um, we have a guest speaker that's going to be bringing God's word next Sunday. And, and that's our very own Patrick Lamb, who is going to just minister um, what God has impressed on his heart. So don't miss that. Next Sunday, I believe that is the, is it the 13th of, of September? And so we're looking really forward to this and be praying for these times when God brings our very own to share with us his heart and um, his teaching through his word. So look, looking forward to that very much. Okay, we're going to get into God's word this morning. The revelation of Jesus Christ is our sermon series. 
we have been going through chapters 1 all the way through chapter 5, and today we're going to dive into chapter 6 and dip our toes into chapter 7. Today is also our integrate service. Um, kids, there's going to be a shekel activity about middle way through the sermon, so be on the lookout for that. Stay tuned for it. Listen carefully. And um, also, just a reminder, we're going to have communion at the end of the service. So if you haven't gotten that ready just yet, then get those elements prepared and we'll share in communion at the wrap-up of our sermon this morning. Our sermon title is, O Sovereign Lord. O Sovereign Lord. It comes from Revelation chapter 6, verse 10. It's our Bible quote for this morning. And it reads this, they, speaking of God's people, specifically those who've been martyred for their faith, for bearing witness to the name of Jesus, they cry out with a loud voice, this is a scene in heaven, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on earth? O sovereign Lord. You know, in the book of Acts, we finished that series just a few months ago. We also saw the same cry from the heart of God's people, not in heaven, but on earth, the, the, the first century church. And it was a scene from Acts chapter 4 where they, the, the Peter and John, they were imprisoned for the first time for preaching the name of Jesus, for healing a lame Men And they were released and warned and threatened to, to not spread any more of this news about Jesus any longer. So they go back to their companions, to the rest of their um, believers and, and brothers and sisters in Christ, and they report all that happened and what was reported to them. And the hearts of the peoples responded in this way. This was their prayer to God. They lifted up their voice to God. And it reads this in verse 24 of Acts chapter 4. When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. O sovereign Lord, creator of the heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. And in verse 29, they continue with the prayer. And now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. We, we saw in that series how God's people, when they were faced with such, such hardship, such surprising reaction to bringing the good news of Jesus Christ, imprisoning them, threatening them, they didn't say, remove this, this threat from us. Instead, they said, consider this threat and, and empower us, give us the strength to go forward and boldly preach the name of Jesus. O Sovereign Lord, you are over all things. A definition, just so everybody understands the word sovereign. Sovereign, as a dictionary definition, simply means a person with supreme power and authority. Somebody who is over all things. And has complete control over all things. You know, that's something very hard for sometimes for us to grasp. But that is the truth about who God is. And I have a question for us as we dive into chapter 6 this morning. I think it's an important question for us to consider. Think about a situation in your life that seems to be outside of your control. In fact, maybe is feels like it is out of control. It's gotten out of hand in some ways. If God was to take over that situation completely, take control over it, what comes to your mind initially in terms of the result? What would you be hoping for would happen when God takes over that situation? When he goes ahead and takes control over whatever that you're thinking of? The answer to that question of whatever comes to your mind, I think, could be quite important in revealing what concerns you the most. 
what is most important to you. And it helps us see and contrast that or compare that with whether or not what concerns you also concerns God. What is priority for you is actually the priority for God. Because is, is what you imagine and what's the first thing that comes to your mind, the removal of that challenge, the elimination of that hardship, the ease of the discomfort, the, the taking away of the pain and suffering, the getting of what you want. Is that what comes to our minds? Or the first thing that comes to our minds is the revelation and the display of God's glory. Because how we answer this question, I believe, as we go into the book of Revelation here further, what we read is either going to surprise us or it's going to satisfy us. Because if what concerns us is what concerns God, meaning that the most important thing for us in our life is that people who have been made in the image of God and meant and created for God's glory are, are completely lost and they are in living in the enslavement to sin and, and, and what we desire above everything else is to bring those people into repentance and salvation no matter the cost. Well then, I believe that is matching up with God's concern, His heart, what He desires. And what we will see as the, the events that unfold or the things that must take place soon, those things, if we understand that, if we desire that above all things of no matter what's happening in our life, if that's our primary concern, then what we re read will satisfy us. But if not, it might take us aback. And, and, and I believe it's important for us to be able to have this perspective that the book of Revelation will bring into our hearts this morning and as we go through this series. Because God's sovereignty is about bringing His glory. It's about bringing His plan and his will to completion. Not our plan and our hope. <laughs> Not necessarily our convenience and our comfort. That, that's not really what the sovereignty of God is about. It is about his perfect and wonderful plan. So here's another thing that as we go into chapter 6, it's going to, this is the part of Revelation that is going to be um, full of different types of interpretation. These events that we're going to be taking a look at, there are l many, many serious students of the Bible who interpret these different events and these different images in different ways. Yeah? You know what I say to that? I say, wonderful. That, that's so good. You know why that's so good? It's because it allows us to generate such wonderful conversations, broaden our perspectives, humble ourselves in seeking God because He has the answer. He has the revelation as long as we're willing to humble ourselves before one another and before God to, to learn from the Holy Spirit because God's word is never purposed and meant to divide his people. Do you hear this? God's word's purpose is never to divide his people. It's meant us to unite us in Christ. So I'm, I'm not going to be championing a per particular perspective or an interpretation. What I want to champion and advocate for us as we go through these chapters, no matter where your perspective is, if it, if it aligns with mine or, or not, is that we fight not to be right, but we fight to be one. 
in all things related to God, His church, and His Word, that the primary way that we approach everything in the kingdom of God is that we fight not to be right, but we fight to be one in Christ. And so that's, I believe, the, the, the prayer that's saturated over this text and all that we're going to learn from here in the future. So please join me and, and all of us as we learn together this, this way of uniting in Christ through what we're learning through the book of Revelation. So with that said, let's go into our first point this morning of God's sovereignty, His supreme rule, His supreme power and authority overall. What that means is that God is sovereign over evil. That's your first blank for this morning if you're following along in our notes. God is sovereign over evil. So as we read chapter 6 verse 1 and following, this is going to be highlighted and it's going to be very, very clear that God has authority over all things including evil. Did you know that? It's really, really important for us to understand this. So let me set up the stage again, just to set up the scene. So last week, we were were seeing John's vision of God's throne, yeah? And as we were just basking in the beauty of God's throne and, and to him who sits on that throne and unto the Lamb, we heard a, 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 a loud voice of the angel speaking about a scroll that was in the hand of God who sits on the throne. And this scroll represented the the fullness of God's plan, right? It was written on the front and back, meaning it was full. There was nothing, it was complete. There was nothing more to write on it. And on it was seven different seals that was, that was closed it up. And the angel proclaimed and asked who is worthy on in heaven or on the earth or under the earth to open and break the seals of the scroll to look within it and it was silent and in this silence john gets nervous he kind of starts to realize wow this is the plan that needs to be fulfilled but if no one takes it there's this sense of overwhelming despair, a defeat of hope, and he starts to weep. But thank God, one of the elders speaks up and he says, stop weeping, because there is somebody who has overcome. The somebody is the the lamb, excuse me, the lion of Judah. He comes from the root of, of David. And so he looks and it's this lion of Judah is actually the slain lamb of God, Jesus the Christ, who died and rose again, who has overcome death. And he, Jesus, walks over and he takes that scroll from the Father's hand. And at that moment, the entirety of heaven erupts in celebration, praise, and worship that the Lamb of God is worthy. So then we jump into chapter 6 right now, and Jesus is now breaking open each and every seal. And as that's happening, events are being unleashed. It is a command of things that are going to happen on earth. And I will tell you this, it's not pretty. In fact, it's very, very devastating and it's very horrifying. So let's read from here. Verse 1, Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a loud, with a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and his rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. Verse 3, When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! And out came another horse, bright red, its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. (laughs) Do do you see what's happening? As each seal is being broken, there is a command from heaven releasing and unleashing these riders that symbolize disaster that's coming upon the earth. 
the first rider was given a crown. This was, this was given by the throne of heaven, by the authority of heaven. The, the thought of this, and there's some interpretations around this, but the one I'm going to go with, it is a, 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 an earthly figure who takes authority of that is, that is of, a, of a savior or a deliverer, one who conquers and says, I am the one who's going to be able to bring a sense of peace on, on earth. So somebody who's given this authority, right? A crown on his head. The second rider is being given a great sword. And his great sword is actually going to allow for people permitted to bring, not to take away the peace on earth and, and slaughter instead of people to where they slay one another, alluding to war. Okay? So these aren't pretty things that are happening. Let's, let's read on in verse Five And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for denarius, which is about a day's wages, and a quart of barley for a denarius, and, and do not harm the oil and wine. Speaking of famine, that is to come upon the earth. Yeah, But there's a limitation. There's a limitation saying, you know, don't harm this, but this is what's going to happen. So the very sustenance of life is going to cost an extraordinary amount of money. And for a lesser quality, the same amount of money, which is going to be a whole day's wages. There's a famine that's going to come on earth, but there's parameters, there's a limitation on it. And behold, verse 8, I look and behold a pale horse and its rider's name was death and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence, disease, and by wild beast of the earth. Wow. So from the command of heaven, from the authority of heaven, we're seeing a release of destruction and devastation across the earth. Did you know that even though the prince of this world is Satan, that God has authority over all evil? We see throughout the Bible this truth. Back in the book of Job, we see that Satan has to ask God's permission to lay even a hand on Job and his possession and his family. And God granted it to him. We saw in the New Testament, Jesus talking to Simon. He said that Satan has asked to sift the disciples like wheat. But instead of Jesus praying that Satan not do that, he prayed instead that his faith and their faith would not fail. Instead, be able to turn around and encourage brothers and sisters in the faith. That, that shows that even though Satan is the ruler of this world, God has supreme authority, ultimate power over all things, including evil. And he allows evil to accomplish his perfect purpose. And, and those of us who, who may not know God in his heart may struggle with this. In fact, this is one of the most age-old questions about God who is all-powerful. How can a God who is all-powerful and, and loving and good allow for so much pain and evil and suffering in this world? And it's an important question. An important question. I believe the book of Revelation helps us start to get a handle of it. And I can't go into all of it. I'll just name two reasons that we'll see and we'll, we'll uncover more and more. First of all, we have to understand that we were the ones who brought sin into the world through our disobedience. And because of that, we're born as slaves to sin. Sin's power. We're, we are born into a kingdom of darkness. And we are sons 
of that darkness, daughters of that darkness. Okay? And that's the world we're born into. And, and, and God's plan, His will, we see in Revelation, is to completely eradicate, eliminate, remove 100% this evil and sin from the earth. Completely. That is His perfect plan. Because that's not what we were made for. His will is to remove it. 100%. But he is waiting. He is delaying. He's, he's delayed doing that. Do you know why? Because if he was to accomplish that right here, right now, then everything in the kingdom of darkness, including those who are enslaved and born into that kingdom of darkness, will also be eradicated. And so we see here in 2 Peter verse 3, chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. This is God's heart. You know, at one time, he destroyed the world through a flood. You don't even have to know your Bible well to know that, except one family, Noah's family. And as that ended, do you know why? Because humanity got so wicked, so evil, God wanted to start over. But he put a rainbow in the sky as a symbol to say that he's never going to flood the earth Again, no matter how wicked humanity would get, and indeed, it got wicked again, evil again, because that is the kingdom, that is the power, that is the authority that we're born into. So he has this plan that is going to be gone once and for all, but his heart in all of this is that he wants none to perish. And so everything he is doing right now is so that you and I and everybody listening to come to repentance and be saved. Just as Noah and his family were saved, that we would be saved because he wants none to perish. This is the heart of God. The second thing of why God permits evil is because he uses it to test his people. Ooh, I don't like that, but it's, it's true. And it's actually for our good. It's for our benefit. Did you know that when you squeeze an orange, apple juice doesn't come out? Did you know that? When you squeeze an orange, the essence of the orange is what is released. And when we are squeezed, when we are crushed, when we are persecuted, you know what ends up coming out? Whatever is in the insides. And the life of God, the aroma of Jesus Christ, the salvation of Him who sits on the throne, the rock of our salvation, that's what's meant to emanate and come out of us for the wonderful hope of those around us. And so he says, we read this in Revelation 2 to the church in Smyrna. He says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. And so God allows and permits evil and destruction to come. And we as God's people, we're not immune to those things. In fact, Revelation shows us that it's not for us to be removed from those things, is that we are to be able to thrive in the midst of those events and things for the purpose of bringing the fulfillment 
God's plan so that no one will perish, but all come to repentance. If you see this, the book of Revelation will start to make sense to you and what is in the heart of God. And so we move into the, the opening of the, the fifth seal. And in this point, I want you to, to see this, this truth being highlighted that God's timing and his plan is perfect. His timing and his plan, it may not be our plan, it may not be our timing, but his timing, his way, his plan is perfect. Let's read here in verse 9 of chapter 6 of Revelation. When Jesus opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. So now we're not on earth anymore. We're, we're in heaven. This seal opens up an activity in heaven. And it, it is about the, the, the souls, the, the followers, the disciples, God's people, who have actually died because of the word of their testimony for the faith in Jesus. And they cry out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on earth? (laughs) Did you know just because you go to heaven, we talked about this last week, you don't know everything. Did you know that? I think a lot of us think the moment we get to heaven, we'll know everything. No, we're not omniscient. That's not who we are. We have an eternity to discover the greatness of, of all of God. And, and, and we see this, even those who have been martyred for their faith, they, they cry out to God in holy desire to say, God, when will you do what you promised to do to bring justice on earth, to avenge our blood, to make right what has been wrong, O oh Lord? How long? It's not maybe they're being impatient, but they, they're saying, what is your timing in this? It, 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 it's like, yeah, we know you're going to do it, O sovereign Lord. But when? How long is this going to be? Do you hear that holy desperation, even a holy sense of frustration and desire for God to do what he said he's going to do? And listen, this is God's response in verse 11. Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest or wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves have been. Okay, so here's here's God's response. So they're they're crying out to God saying, when our God are you going to bring your perfect justice? to make right all the different wrongs, to avenge our blood. And he says to them, wait just a little bit longer because there's going to be more of you. In fact, there's going to be, there's a number that's going to be complete of those who will be killed, murdered for their testimony. And until that number is complete, that promise will not come just yet, but wait a little longer. And so their cry is to say, avenge our death and bring your perfect justice. And he's saying, my plan is that there's going to be more of you that are going to be added. That's not our plan, is it? That's not necessarily our way and not necessarily our timing. And so brothers and sisters, If your faith gets to that point where you are, you know in your mind that God is sovereign, that he is in control over our things, but you are getting weary. You have this holy desperation inside of you, holy frustration inside of you. Just cry out to him, O sovereign Lord, and trust that his plan and his timing is perfect. It's perfect. It's not yours. It's not your way. It's not your timing. But what he has planned is absolutely perfect. You know, this 
this book of Revelation, we've been going back and saying there's links into the Old Testament, right? These images and things. And in fact, there, there's this one as well in um, Zechariah chapter 1 and chapter 6. We don't have time to go into that today. So if you want to take a look, chapter 1 and 6 of Zechariah, you can do that. It talks about the writers. Very similar picture here. But today I want to link to uh, a New Testament passage. The, the very words of Jesus Christ that parallel almost perfectly what we're seeing here in the book of Revelation. Here, here chapter 6. And these are the words of Jesus prophesying, telling, and, and, and showing, revealing to us what's to come, as we're also seeing here in the book of Revelation. I want to start in verse 4 of chapter 24, Matthew 24, verse 4, and I'll read from there. And it says this, And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. There's going to be people who have been, been given authority, who are going to be messianic pretenders. They're going to say they're the Savior and they're the deliverer for people, and they're going to lead many astray. This is a, a day like this is coming, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. People of God, see that you are not alarmed by this, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. Verse 7, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Did you hear that? All that we're hearing of wars, of famines and earthquakes and, 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 and mis false messiahs that are going to be coming, these are not about the end, but a, a precursor, kind of a, a preview to what's going to be happening in the end. These are like birth pains. And I don't know this from experience, just from many, wor uh, from many reports, that birth pains are painful. In fact, in Genesis, God says, I will greatly multiply the pains of childbirth. And in great pain that we will bring, women will be bearing children into this world. So it is painful, but there's a pain, purpose to that pain. There's a purpose to that suffering. You know what that purpose is? To usher in new life. Eternal life. And what Jesus is saying is that these things, though as painful as they mean, they have a purpose. And that is to usher in the very life of God. New life here on earth. And so these things have a purpose to them. I mean, let me read the rest of Math, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 24 and, and verse 9. And they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sakes. Verse 10, and then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Do you see the parallel here? <laughs> all of these things have a purpose. It is to bring the message of God's word to all the nations so that none will perish, but all come to repentance. And all of these things that God is commanding from the throne of heaven have that purpose in mind. I want to take a pause here. And kids, if you've been doing other things or you've been listening, wonderful, come together. Here's your shekel activity. Okay, And it has to do what with what we just read here, Matthew chapter 24. Go ahead and read verse 7 and verse 8 again, just to get this in your mind of what we're talking about. And then here's your second, here's what you, I'm asking you to do. Ask your parents, you, 
it's like an interview. You want to interview your parent or parents and ask them these two questions. First question, were, you, were there any challenges you faced getting ready for my birth or my coming home and being a part of the family? Okay. Second question, what was one special thing you remember on the day that you brought me home? What's one special thing you remember? Yeah, about the day I was born or the day I became part of the family. And it could be now, it could be later. Once you get those answers and, and, and hear from your parents, if they're willing to share with you, post that onto our Facebook page. As a post today, you can put in the comment section you, what you learned. Um, if you'd rather send it to uh, by email, you can do that, admin at the nations.asia. We'll get that and pass that forward to um, our children's ministry coordinator. So that's your shekel activity, five shekels for you today for that. All right. So God's timing, his plan is perfect. It's meant to usher in new life for those who are enslaved to darkness. Next, God's wrath. Here's a third point. God's wrath will bring complete justice. God's wrath will bring complete justice. I don't know about you. I don't know how you feel about reading the news these days or ever, but for me, it, it's hard. It's heartbreaking. In fact, most of the time, I just skip the news and go, just go to tech news <laughs> because it's hard to find bad news in tech news, you know, and just reading about gadgets and things. But there's times where you just have to read what's going on in the world, and it's heartbreaking. It's devastating. The level of human depravity that is around us right now is just unbelievable. I mean, we have parents doing such harm, even murdering their own children, children killing their parents. We have hatred of racism that goes into death and even genocide still going on in countries and tribes. Ha! Huh. People across the world calling evil good and good evil. Did you know there are laws already in place across the world in different countries where it is illegal to read public texts, I mean, to, uh, religious texts in public on the basis that these religious texts are offensive by nature. So it's illegal, it's criminal to read it out loud. In fact, there are laws being passed, already passed in countries across different parts of the world where it is against the law to speak out against anybody who says that they are a woman when they are indeed physiologically a man, even children. So it's illegal for an adult, whether you're a parent or a teacher, to speak against a child if they believe that they are another gender than they are born to be. We live in a world system, my dear friends, where the subjective truth, subjective reality of our opinions, of our feelings, of our desires, override objective truth. Huh, definitely truth that God speaks to us as absolute. That is the world that we live in. Did you know, and this is what's so heartbreaking to me, that there are actually associations. There are pedophile asso advocacy associations that are in place across the world. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah? These are associations advocating for those with pedophilism, saying that they are to be included as a sexual orientation. <sighs> that it's no different than being gay. It's no different than being gay. It's unchangeable. And for society to, to embrace this, and right now, it's a hugely controversial, but I'm afraid the foundation has already been laid for this to be argued and this to be advocated. To where 
this world is advocating for things that are evil to be good and good to be evil to where the trajectory of brothers and sisters, listen to this, we're on a trajectory to where it will be criminal for the people of God to say sin is sin. There comes a day when we stand against what is wrong and sinful and say it and that will land us in prison. That's the trajectory that we are heading right now. This is a world that we are coming into. And so, to, to fight against it with just laws and policy, that, that's not the answer. As we see here in the book of Revelation and throughout God's word and truth, O oh, sovereign Lord, consider these threats. And instead, give us the power to preach the name of Jesus, the gospel, boldly. That's what we need to be ready for. That's what we need to be prepared for, my brothers and sisters. You see, we are all, all made in the image of God, even though this image has been marred with sin, twisted and bent and completely marked up with sins. But that should never be a reason or excuse to live in sin, identify with sin, be enslaved with sin. Because there comes a day, and this is what we're going to be reading about, there comes a day when it doesn't matter what you believe, it doesn't matter what authority you hold, or your, what power you wield, or who th people think of you, what you are advocating for, all of humanity will be leveled by the wrath of God. And nothing that you believe in that is true, that is hostile against the holiness of God will stand. There comes a day and so the word and the, the heart of God is to say, repent, do not let the marring of sin on who you are to be made in the glory of God be the excuse for you to live in sin and, and say, yes, I've been made in the image of God, but let me turn around and do a favor and create God in my own image, in my own definition. This will not stand. In the judgment of God. Let me read this. Verse 12, when he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale or strong wind. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. This is horrifying. Then the kings of the earth, the great ones, the generals, the rich and the powerful, and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand and the answer is no one it be you king of the earth slave or free great one rich powerful it doesn't matter there comes a day where the wrath of God will bring everyone to their knees. To where people, unrepentant people, will come in great terror, calling out to the mountains and rocks to fall on them so that it might hide them and shelter them from the wrath of God. But the only thing that will shelter you from the wrath of God is the slain Lamb of God. Nothing else. And just as the wrath of God levels all of humanity, the gospel of the, of the kingdom, the gospel of the Lamb of God also levels it to where anybody, 
anybody, regardless of what you've done, not have done, where you fall in society's levels, it doesn't matter, is equal at the foot of the cross, as long as you're willing to come and say, Lord, I repent. I turn from sin into you and trust you, what you have done, my Lord, my Savior, on that cross, punished for my sins because Jesus has taken the wrath of God for you. He was already punished for you. And he died for you so that you could be alive in him and live forever with him. This is the gospel that is being preached to you. And if you've never trusted in Christ, the slain Lamb of God, to be your Savior, do not delay. Because the only thing that will shelter you from the wrath of God is the Lamb of God. And here's our last point for this morning. God will shelter and seal his people when this is happening, all throughout this is happening. Revelation chapter 7, verse 2 and 3, Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So before all of these things are to happen, God will seal us with an assurance and evidence that through whatever happens, that we are sheltered from his wrath. This doesn't mean we, to be sealed by God doesn't mean that we're immune to suffering and to the pain that, will, that is to incur. But we are sealed with the assurance that the inheritance that is ours, the, 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 the richness of heaven, the, the life of internal is ours. And that which we have is what allows us to sacrifice our own life for the triumph and victory in others, just like the slain Lamb of God. Let me read this last verse in chapter 7 and end with this. Revelations chapter 7 verse 15. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is, we're not immune to the suffering. We're not immune to the tribulation. But this is our reality. This is one day what becomes true. And therefore, how we are be able to thrive through the coming days of what God intends to do to bring all to repentance. Praise God. We're going to take communion now. I believe this is not only a time of reflection, but a time of response of our heart to what God is putting on our heart, what he is impressing on our hearts. I want to share Ephesians chapter 1 and use this as our main text to focus on as we take communion this morning. So get your elements prepared. I'm going to open up my bread. Hold it in your hands. Let's wait together to take it in oneness. Ephesians 1, 13. And you were also included in Christ. Oh, just meditate on that word. Included. Included in Christ. Because Jesus was slain for you, 
died for you, punished for you, buried for you, his body given up for you, we are included in Christ. And this happened when we heard the message of truth, the gospel of our salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Did you know Jesus' body was marked? It was wounded. And those marks he took for us. And then as a result, the only mark that we have is the seal of the Holy Spirit. That's our mark because of what Jesus did. Let's praise God for that in prayer together. Let's break the bread. Let's take it together. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the truth, the gospel of your salvation, the gospel meaning that Jesus loves you. Therefore, he willingly came to earth to become human so that he could suffer as a human, depend on God as a human. He never sinned, but he suffered as he did so that you, by faith, putting your trust in him, may never die. Yes, there will be a physical death, but there is an eternity waiting with God. This is what Jesus did. This is the, the gospel of your salvation. And when you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance and the, until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. As Jesus commanded us and instructed us, there are going to be coming many different authorities in this world, in our lifetime, that will try to lead us astray. And Jesus' words are, do not be led astray. Can we pray and ask God to strengthen us, to, to, to lead us, to not be led astray? Because the blood that we're about to drink, the, the symbol of his blood, this is the reason that we have our inheritance in heaven. And this is what we're looking to so that we can not only endure, but truly be able to exemplify and reveal the glory of God through whatever is happening around us. But we must stay faithful, not be led astray. So let's drink in celebration, but also in seeking God that He keep us, empower us, to be able to reveal God's glory through whatever that we may be going through. Let's drink the, the fruit of the vine together. Jesus, we worship you. We lift our hearts and our hands to you with thanksgiving in our hearts for what you have done for us. Father, we know we did not deserve anything that you did out of your love, but we are completely overwhelmed and drawn into worship and praise because you did it out of your love to save us to save us from our sin, that we are no longer slaves of sin, but freed to be able to let the world know who you are. 
And I pray, Father, that you will work and minister into each of us as you bring your word into our hearts. Because I know, Father, you are preparing us. That we take the blood of the Lamb seriously. Of what Jesus did for our lives seriously. That because, Jesus, you have given up your life for us, we belong to you completely. And so, Holy Spirit, convict us. Convict us that we can live from heaven's vantage point, from what you have done and, Father, what you have planned, regardless of what's happening here on earth, so that, Lord, we can be used to fulfill your purpose and your will. So continue to speak into our hearts and show us your way. We thank you for being sovereign over all things. And we trust you in your great sovereignty. In Jesus we pray. Amen.